Hello, my name is Josh Powers and I'm a 3D artist with Quixel. I've previously worked on many games over the past decade, including Doom, Call of Duty, Halo, and Borderlands. Today I'm going to show you a bit of the process that I use to build environments inside the Unity game engine, exclusively using assets curated from Quixel's Megascans. If you're not familiar, Megascans is the world's largest library of PBR scan surfaces, vegetation, 3D assets, and more and used in most major games and films of today. You may already know of Megascans, as the Unity team used it extensively to create the environments for Book of the Dead and Adam. Together, Quixel and Unity have since been working hard to make this massive library of assets available to the Unity community, and to help empower small development teams to create games and experiences with the same high quality graphics and tools that the major game and film studios use. In this tutorial, we'll go over how to quickly build scenes using Megascans asset packs, how to use Megascans Bridge to access the entire online library and import straight into Unity, and Quixel Mixer to create awesome custom surfaces to further detail your scenes. And on that note, let's dive right in. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start off with the ground. Uh, instead of using a terrain object, I'm using ground assembly meshes that come with the pack. And I'm just duplicating them around right now uh, to get a base layout for this little corner I'm making. Uh, by rotating them and carefully scaling them at times, I'm able to get a lot of mileage out of this one mesh without it feeling too repetitive. Obviously for this example, I'm worrying less about poly count as I'm building a more high-end scene similar to how the environments were built in Unity's Atom. But Megascan assets all come with heavily optimized LEDs so that you can easily get great performance when creating your game. Now I'm starting to work with some of the rocks, and in this pack I have several assets to choose from. I look at these a little bit like Lego pieces, and I have different shapes and sizes that I can use in several different ways to build up my scene. Again, like I was doing with the ground assemblies, I'm able to get a lot of use out of each mesh just by how I position and scale it. You can also add vegetation, decals, and other smaller props to help stretch this further to give a unique appearance while using just a small set of assets. You'll notice that most of the larger rock pieces have open faces. This can limit their use to some extent, but there are ways we can compensate for that by strategically positioning them or using other assets to conceal those open faces. While you need to be mindful of textile density when scaling the meshes, uh, you do have a little bit of give here for the sake of variety, and don't be afraid to scale on one axis if you think it'll look good. As long as you keep the scales reasonable, you shouldn't have any problems. Here I'm covering a pretty noticeable seam between two meshes with another rock. This not only hides the seam, but it also creates a bit of a visual breakup between the two identical cliff meshes. And now I'm adding some more rocks at the base of the bigger rock I used to cover the seam to help its transition to the ground. Here I'm wanting to create some more visual interest with the rock faces by having a bit of a tiered look instead of everything being vertical. And now I'm creating an end cap or termination point for the cliff mesh. While this scene is something of a diorama, I don't want to have open faces visible from anywhere within what I would consider the play space. I'm adding some ground assemblies up above, and now some rocks. Even though I wouldn't envision the player being able to get up there, it does add some verticality to the scene and helps avoid making the scene just feel like a bowl. Again, just rotating and scaling the assets and combining them with others will give them a different look. Every so often, I like to rotate around the scene a little bit to make sure that everything's staying on track. I also use this opportunity to make small tweaks and adjustments to assets that I've already placed. Now that I have a bit of a base to work with, I'm going to go ahead and start playing with some of the post-process settings. When you do this is entirely up to you. Uh, I personally like to get a little bit of the groundwork laid out and then do a first pass to help set the tone for the scene early on and then adjust it as I get further along. Now I'm just playing with some of the directional light settings in the scene. Uh, I'm giving it a more dramatic angle, adjusting the temperature for a warmer look, and increasing the intensity. Uh, 
All right, let's start getting some trees in there. I'm placing a tree in the upper area I created earlier to help break up the silhouette of the rocks. I'll add some more rocks and vegetation later on to help push this further. Now I'm placing the same tree in the main play space on its side to start adding some interesting detail to the ground. As I place a couple of standing trees, I'm moving them around and adjusting the scale and rotation to try and find a placement that I'm happy with. I've positioned the camera back to show most of the scene, so that way I can check on my composition from time to time. After moving the tree on the ground, I feel like I have a pretty nice balance of the trees placed in this scene. Now I'm going to swap out some of the ground assemblies with a less rocky variant. This will help break up the ground visually, but I could also use it as a bit of a path or trail for the player to follow if I wanted to. Since the sandy ground asset has a bit less height to it than the rockier one, the base of the fallen tree has become visible. So I'm just going to play with that a little more and sink it back down. Like before, I'm just duplicating and rotating to keep things from looking too repetitive. I noticed that the shadowed areas in the scene are a bit too dark, so I'm going to change the environment lighting from skybox to gradient. This will allow me to have a little more control on the ambient lighting. With the values I chose, the shadowed areas are a little more visible, and there's also a bit of color as well. Now if I was creating this for a game or a similar project, I would probably use an HDR sky for both the skybox and the environment lighting. But for the purposes of this tutorial, we're using the standard gradient sky with Unity. Now I'm going to further break up the ground by adding some more of the volcanic rocks around. One of the cool things about using the ground assemblies is the unevenness in the geometry. This allows you to get some nice looking shapes in the rocks as you raise or lower them into the ground. Here's an instance where I thought a rock might work in one area, but quickly decided it would be better off up against the rock face instead. Iteration is key. Sometimes you're going to be happy with how something looks on the first pass, and other times you won't. And in some cases, things might look good at first, but once you add a few other pieces to the scene, suddenly that thing that worked before no longer fits, and you'll need to adjust or even delete. And the same is true for the inverse, uh, where something might feel out of place until the level's further along, and then it just works. So try to stay flexible as you flesh out the level. Uh, once you're happy with the overall layout, look, and composition, then begin adding the smaller details that will really start bringing the scene to life. Here's another example of how you can get some cool looking shapes by sinking rocks into the ground. Here I'm using a 3D mesh painter to lay down some smaller rocks in various places around the scene. Uh, there are several different mesh painters available on the asset store and in my opinion they're worth every penny. This kind of tool will save you a lot of time when working in outdoor environments. 
Uh, they'll also give you a greater sense of randomness to the placement of your assets as opposed to putting everything down by hand. Uh, most of the time this works out great and I won't need to tweak anything. However, I'm not always happy with the end results and I will make adjustments as I see fit. Most of the time I leave these things for more of the polishing phase, but sometimes I will make those adjustments as I'm painting so that I can continue to paint with those changes already made. In this particular scene, I decided to place the vegetation by hand. Uh, because most of the plants have more of a shrub or even small tree look to them, I wanted to be more intentional with their placement, rotation, and scale. Uh, however, this is just a small corner of a level, which gives me the flexibility to do this. If I was building a level that was 5 or 10 or even 50 times larger than this area, um, or I was laying down more traditional grass tufts, uh, I would certainly be leveraging the 3D Mesh Painter again. Now I'm using a different plant that has similar characteristics as the other, but is different enough to cause a bit of contrast between the two. One of the nice things about this plant set is that it comes with a couple of ground prefabs made up of twigs and small branches. This is a really quick way to add complexity around the base of trees and other vegetation. As I mentioned before, I'm placing these by hand so that I have more control over what plant goes where. Using some of the taller, more slender plants back in between some of these rocks is a nice way to soften the transition from the ground to the rock face. With all the dead trees around, it would make sense to see a lot of branches lying on the ground as well, so it's time to start dropping some of those into the scene. While it's impossible to avoid completely, I try to make sure that things like branches, twigs, and vegetation aren't clipping through the rocks or other branches. It can be a bit tedious to rotate and move each one several times until it looks just right, but the attention to detail will pay off in the end. I also like to make sure I even have a little bit of detail in small crevices or nooks that will not likely have much screen space. Placing a stick or a few plants in little areas like this doesn't take a lot of time, but it can add a lot to the overall believability of the scene. Overall the scene is looking pretty monochromatic, so I'm adding a few of these green and yellow plants around to give it some much needed splashes of color. Up to this point, I've been building the scene in layers, starting with the ground, then the rocks, then trees and plants. But now that the major components are in place, I'm shifting into a polish mode and I'm adding or adjusting assets wherever I feel it's needed. And that's pretty much it. I was able to create this very detailed environment extremely quickly using only the Megascans assets. And the same principles apply no matter which assets you're using. Here you can see me working with the Valley Asset Pack, utilizing the terrain tools in Unity to sculpt and paint the ground around the 3D scans. This is also an instance where I relied heavily on a 3D mesh painter to paint down the majority of the vegetation in the scene. And here's another example using the Wasteland Asset Pack. Let's say that you want to use a different asset from the Megascans library. We can easily achieve this by using Megascans Bridge. With Bridge, you can download anything from the entire library then export it to your 3D package. And we're adding lots of new assets to the library every day to give you an endless variety to choose from. 
Before we download anything, we want to make sure that we have our directory settings properly assigned. Once those are set, click Save. Now we're ready to search for an asset. I'll do a search for Rocks 3D, which will exclude tiling surfaces and only show me 3D scans. We'll scroll around a little bit and look for something that might fit with the theme of the Lava Field Pack. Here we go. This one might work. When you click on an asset, you'll not only see information such as scale and whether it's an open or closed mesh, but you'll also be able to change the download settings. You can change the resolution, amount of LODs, source files, and the texture outputs. I'm going to leave everything as they are. Now we can download. Now that the download's complete, we will export. The export options are limited to what you've downloaded, which in this case is 4K textures and JPEGs, so there's nothing to change. And for the application setting, we'll simply change this to Unity and then click Export. Now we need to install the Megascans importer. Simply go up to Asset, Import Package, and click on Custom Package. Find the Megascans importer package and click Open. We'll click Import here. Now we have a window pop up. We just want to make sure the import path and asset prefix are consistent with the package we're assigning them to. In this case, Lava Field is already being used, so we can go ahead and close the window. Now that the importer is installed, we can go ahead and find the exported QXL file from Bridge and drag it into the Assets folder in Unity. It might take a few minutes to get everything imported. Now we'll find the Prefab folder and drag the Prefab into the scene, and voila! This process is fully automated, which means you spend less time with the tedious technical work and more time creating art. Though there are thousands of surfaces to choose from in the Megascans library, sometimes your scene might require something a bit more custom. This is where Quixel Mixer comes into play. I can take several scan surfaces and combine them to create something unique. Mixer is very simple to use, and you can quickly get some incredible results just by playing with some of the blending sliders on the side. However, if you want to be able to fine tune things a bit more, you can control the blending by masking it by hand. I don't like these rocks in the grassier areas of the surface, so I'm going to go ahead and use the displacement layer above to control where they come through. Now I'm adding another mud surface to further break up the materials. And then I'll make a quick adjustment to the albedo color to match the color of the dirt and the other surfaces. After a few more minutes of adjusting and painting, I have a material I'm pretty happy with, so we're ready to export to the library. From there, you'd follow the same steps as before. Export the surface from Bridge, then drag the generated QXL file into Unity, and your surface will be ready for use. I hope this tutorial has been helpful to you. Be sure to click subscribe and keep an eye out for more great videos from the Quixel team. Thanks for watching.